Jack. Okay. So we so we if we decided which version of the story you're going to be be telling. No, us. no, no. Don't pull any crap on me today. All right. I'm a little I'm a little nervous about today because uh, we're telling a little bit of a story of Frog's Leap and uh, Rory's been planning this and I have no idea what he's unearthed or is what he's going to bring to the table today. But hey, everyone. I'm John Williams, owner and winemaker of Frog's Leap. I'm Rory Williams, uh, official idiot son of Frog's Leap Winery. Oh, you finally got your title. I finally got my title right. <laughs> and you finally haven't got a haircut either. No, 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 that's not. It's like not really, it's really getting bad. You know, I, I, you know, I can't afford one. You got to get a pay me a little more for a haircut. This is a bad time. It's a bad time. <laughs> bad time. Well, well, welcome everyone. We are. We're going to have fun today. We're going to uh, take a trip back uh, in, down memory lane. At least for me. I mean, I, I, I it is kind of. I feel like this is a. I mean, the story of Frog Sleep involves a fair amount of my own personal history, mm -hmm. and um, and so I don't want to make this as your life sort of thing, but I mean, it isn't in my life, really. <laughs> we're going <we're> to <laughs> actually some flash some images up, and we're hopeful that it won't send them into a trance. Well, and I'll apologize for all of you who've been, who've been at the winery or have uh, been on the website and read the official version of the history of Frog Sleep, because I can never remember... Uh, uh, how some of the stories have been embellished a little bit over the years, and uh, yeah. so we we may have just a whole new version today. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Well, now, are there any uh, any technicalities? Yeah, we should. Uh, yeah. So we should point out. Uh, hopefully, all of you have been able to uh, locate a bottle of Frog Sleep. Oh well, yeah, that's right. It was everyone's challenge today it was to find a bottle at their find your, a bottle of Frog Sleep at your local store, uh, local restaurant, doing some carry out, and uh, we uh, we're hopeful that you guys will share with us in the chat what you found. And uh, we're going to hopefully be able to comment throughout. As always, encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A. And very much in the Q&A, please upvote any questions you, uh, you know, give a thumbs up to any questions you want to see answered, because uh, that puts it at the top of my list. And I have a very, very short attention span. And so it's, very, it's nice to have the, 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 the important questions float to the top. So please, uh, please do use that. Yeah, we want to hear where you found, what, what kind of wine you found out there. And, and we were particularly uh, interested to hear stories, because we, remember, we told you if you went out and you're favorite place that has wine uh, doesn't have frog sleep you were supposed to scold them and i hope you 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 gave a couple of people and, and i'll tell you the reason we do that is because we can go into a store a hundred times and ask them to carry our wines and they may or may not depending on how they feel if one of you goes in and says hey you don't have any frog sleep not cool They'll have it the like next that. day. <laughs> hey, you got any frogs? I've got to get that in there. So you are, so, you're our, you are our, uh, our sales army. You, you know? are our sales army. So we really appreciate when you uh, mentioned that uh, you wouldn't mind them uh, stocking our wines. So hopefully that happened. A little and, bit you know, and, so, and we found some wines as well. Uh, yeah. You know, we're we're going to try. Speaking of. Uh, yeah, but first. Oh, what? First, I want to start us off with, with something real special. And I know it's real close to your heart. Is a little Welch's green cheese. Because <laughs> I didn't know they still made it. <laughs> this is, this is, yeah, I don't want very much. I know, I know. We're not going to pour it very much, yeah. but we got to got to taste it because uh, part of the story. I, I guess. I think huh? if we're gonna if we're gonna start, I don't even know that this part of it is on the website. But um, if we're gonna start with sort of the history of you and wine and grapes, you got to go back to a, you know. This should remind you. This should have some uh, some Chautauqua County terroir. In it. Right well, uh, I grew up in Chicago, uh, Chautauqua County, which is a little corner of New York over by uh, Lake Erie and in uh, the little town of Northeast Pennsylvania, where uh, 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 is, is the Welch's Grape Juice Factory. And I worked there, uh, I don't know, two or three. Or, uh, I don't know summers. either. So you yeah, should, I, you should I, really I, tell I, the group. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I never got to work on grape juice. So uh, I was there for the jams, the and, jams uh, and, and everything. And so on because by the time grape time, I was back in school. But uh, Dad, oh, Dad, we're, we're supposed to we're supposed to give the best version of the story. Oh, okay. okay. Right. So, no, you you remember working over the call oh, right. and all yeah. this brings you back to. Uh, no, I'll tell you what this reminds me of is actually, uh, it, you know, I grew up as a good Methodist, and uh, when we had communion, of course, we weren't going to drink alcohol, which is the devil's work, and uh, so our communion was with uh, uh, Welch's grape juice. Do we have and, any crackers? Uh, and, we can and, do and it right so now. this uh, takes me right back with Edwards Chapel and. Uh, French Creek in New French York. Creek, New York. Yes, so, which is where the town where my dad grew up. French Creek, the primer area. Of New York. Are you actually going to drink any of this? Yeah, I'm yeah. going to try this. Now this has got what they call the foxy character of mm -hmm. Lombrusca grapes, right? Concord is not Avitus vinifera. You guys have heard us talking genus and species last week, 
This is Vitus Labrusca. Actually, is it a hybrid of Labrusca? Yeah, I, I believe it's a pure, I think it's pure Labrusca. Oh, um, but they, all these, all, a lot of these, not all, but a lot of these native grapes like Concord, when you get that kind of real Jolly Rancher artificial grape taste, <laughs> that's actually common to most native grape varieties, which is what Concord's like. And the reason that they grow a lot of Concord in that area is because it doesn't die in the it's winter. The only thing <laughs> it's the only thing that will grow in that area. And the first grape I never saw was the only Concord grape that would survive in my grandparents' backyard. And, uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Speaking uh, of your grandparents' backyard, you grew up on a dairy farm. Natalie, can we get the first photo up there? Oh, got a, yeah, kind of uh, a, so now these photos are going to be a little bit of a surprise here. But uh, yeah, uh, 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 Chautauqua County and then uh, well, there's, there's my mom and my dad and my brother, Jim, who, yeah. And uh, you know who's oh, who's there, but you can't see is Susan because uh, mom is uh, is pregnant in that photo. But this is us down at uh, Grandpa Madison's uh, uh, dairy farm where I spent most of my summers growing up. For some reason, uh, we would go down for um, after church every Sunday and uh, and uh, for Sunday dinner, uh, and I would get left behind in uh, all summer long. I would get left behind at Grandpa and Grandma's. So I when I tell people I because. Mom and dad's place, you know, wasn't a dairy farm, but grandpa's place. And so I spent most of my summers on, uh, on a dairy farm, far from uh, Concord. Uh, on a dairy farm and around your three siblings, uh, yeah. which I think we have a photo of all, all, th all four of you together uh, is the next photo that we have up oh here. Oh my gosh. So way, way back in the day. Yeah, there's the old, the old farmstead there. This is mom and dad's house and uh, the house I grew up in. Uh, we since had to take it out, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So but, uh, you yeah. grew up. Uh, you grew up in in Clymer, and uh, Chautauqua County is a or Clymer at least is a dry town. It, uh, it is, and uh, so uh, and and it's the tradition that I grew up with. My family never uh, drank. Uh, we were as as kids growing up. Uh, uh, we were taught that uh, uh, alcohol made you an alcoholic, and that that was um, bad, and it is. Um, but I grew up with pretty, which is not unusual, I think, at that time to yeah. grow up with repressed feelings about uh, uh, the enjoyment of alcohol. And, uh, you know, it's funny when we were talking to Eric Asimov, you know, and learning to enjoy wine is one thing. But when you start in the hole of thinking it's terrible and yeah. bad for you. It's, it's one thing to not know anything <laughs> about wine. It's, one, it's another to have an actively negative opinion about it. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I got out of climber. You did yeah. get out of climber. So you got to Cornell University, I did. and you've told me, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, that you were one of the first people to graduate from your high school and go to a to an Ivy League school or to a to a four year university. Well, I know I think that's stretching a little bit, but uh, <laughs> you know, we, we're not won't be the first stretch we do today. But yeah. uh, uh, Cornell was a, a fundamental change in my life. I was part of the notable class of '74. I think there's a few uh, us. Class of '74 alumni out there, including, the including Mr. Yeah, others. <laughs> Easy. We're missing our actually. Uh, we were having our anniversary. I won't tell you which. Well, you could probably do the math. Uh, uh, and uh, we couldn't have it this year. So uh, hopefully, a few of my classmates are listening, in, including Bill Quain, my roommate at Cornell, who is the Cornell mascot, the bear at Cornell. But here I come off the farm and I go to Cornell. It was the middle of the. I'm going to talk about this. Was the middle of the. Uh, civil rights movement. It was the middle of the Vietnam War. It was uh, drugs. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it just so fundamentally different than than climber. And I mean, I got off. I walked into it. I just got this big. It's fundamentally changed my life. I had had a brief encounter with wine before that. I didn't even tell you about. I, I don't know that I know this actually. I don't know if any of you uh, did this when you were, most of you were much younger, but I mean, we used to sell magazines in high school in order to earn money for your class trip, right? And uh, there was always a competition to see who could sell the most magazines. And, and there were only two of us in our uh, class that gave a damn, uh, me and John Griffin. Well, Griffin was pulling ahead. And, uh, and so I knew I had to get one more subscription. Uh, the night before we uh, decided who the winner was going to be, I couldn't. And so I actually subscribed to the only thing on the list that uh, that I hadn't sold or uh, gotten a relative to buy, and that was Gourmet Magazine. Now, Gourmet Magazine was probably the, it was, you know, it, it, no one would, what's Gourmet Magazine, right? right? So I ended up getting a subscription of Gourmet. I hid it because, you know, <laughs> <laughs> other, other boys in this class hid a different types of magazines <laughs> under the mattress, but it, in Climber, you had to hide. You had to hide your your copy of, 
of Gourmet Mag. Well, the wine writer, uh, the, the, the columnist at that time was Gerald Asher. And, mm -hmm. and I started reading this magazine and, and it was all these magical places and vineyards in France and, and vintners and so on. And I was reading these stories and I was actually uh, kind of like, that's amazing. And I, I, in the recesses of my brain, I was thinking someday I'm not going to be drinking Welch's grape juice anymore. And I you might be drinking drink something just a little bit tastier. tastier. <laughs> So, it's, uh, yeah, let's take now, now you've had your first introduction. Well, we'll have our first introduction to wine today. Yes, please. <laughs> we're pouring the, uh, we're, we're, we've got the 18 Shannon Open, new release, and uh, actually haven't tasted this wine since we've, since we released it. So, we want yeah, to give yeah, it a shot. Yeah, so it's just out now and, uh, and, and available. And, and let's uh, check out some of the stuff uh, other folks are tasting. 17 Hilltop oh my from God. Rossi Vineyard. Great, one of the great blocks we have at Rossi, yeah. a fellowship selection. So, yeah. cheers, to, cheers to you, fellow. Um, yeah. that, that's a, you know, that was a successful year, uh, despite it being well, We know year. that's a frog fellow because uh, you can't get that as much. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah. 18 Chardonnay, the Shale and Stone, very awesome. Yeah. And uh, lots of Zinfandels, 93 Zin. Wow, that's actually just had that, uh, let's see, a couple of months ago, and it was really, really nice. <laughs> You've been going to the I've been cellar. poaching your cellar. Uh, sorry. Uh, I mean, I I remember drinking a 90 uh, Merlot. That's the first Merlot we ever made. Yeah. Oh my God! Oh wait, petite Syrah. Wow, that's so you've been uh, holding on to that. That should be tasting quite nice, uh, along with uh, somebody's got the 08 cab, very nice. Yeah, and the 16 cab still, uh, you know, really. I think the 16 is really showing nice right now. It's really it, it's, starting it's, to come into its, its own. Uh, it's lost some of its baby fat, and it's really uh, starting to taste pretty good. Very, Speaking very of cool. tasting pretty good, I mean, this is a. Mm. How many points would we give the Welch's dad? How many points would you give them? <laughs> I knew someone was going to ask. Oh, man. <laughs> I'll tell I, you I, feel like, I feel like if the scale goes vertical, zero to 100 for vinifera grapes, <laughs> the, the, the conquered, uh, the, the brusca timeline is horizontal right around well, you'll, 30. You'll see later in the story, I've actually made a wine out of Concord uh, while I was at Glenora Wine Cellars. And what I would only thing I'd say about that Welch's grape juice is it's actually better than when it's fermented. It yeah, right. it's true. <laughs> <laughs> try, don't don't try fermenting Concord at home, no, folks. It's no. uh, it, it rarely goes well. Yeah, it uh, it's it's just that the, that aroma, the whole foxy aroma, the the grape juice aroma is uh, is actually a a bird repellent smell. Birds don't like that smell, so uh, and apparently it's a human repellent too. So, yeah. hey, what, what do you where do you take it? Remember, we've been talking all of us about the reductive and, and oxidative curve. Uh, about how wines, once they're bottled, they start to open and flower. I'd say this is um, a little, um, this is not reduced at all. I think it's really coming it, out of the I, box. I think it's really tight, but it, it's it's still quite young. And I, But I don't think it's, I think it's in that nice kind of middle zone where it's starting to open up and really starting to get that flower petal, uh, get some of that, uh, that beeswaxy kind of character to it. Really. You know what I love about Shannon is you can feel that you can smell the thickness of this wine. The body of this wine is really, really, really cool. Yeah, yeah, great, 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 great stuff. Very cool. So you got to Cornell University, and you did not go to study wine at Cornell. No, no. <laughs> they, well, they didn't have any wine making classes. So, right. Uh, wine was still not a. Uh, it was a, not a happening thing there, as far as I knew. Um, but uh, you know, uh, but I came of age and and. And, and, uh, and, and really opened myself up to pie. I met people actually uh, who were into food and so on and so forth. It was really great. It was a tremendous, tremendous experience going now. Unfortunately, I ran out of money and had to leave uh, school uh, my sophomore year. Um, and because I, uh, we just, uh, the farm wasn't doing well back home. And, uh, and so I was going to go back to Welch's, I guess, and, and make uh, some money so I'd go back to school. But the university suggested a work study program where you could, uh, uh, earn money and get credit, school credit at the same time. And I said, great, what do you got? Well, the only thing they had was the uh, an, uh, an internship or a work study program at the Taylor Wine Company. And uh, the Taylor Wine Company at this point was the Taylor family and uh, they made wine out of the Native American grapes, Catawba, Concord, and, uh, and uh, Duchess, and uh, Niagara, and all these uh, uh, varieties. And I didn't know, I never, like I said, I never really had a bottle of wine. I'd read about it in Gourmet secretly, but uh, I'd never had it. You knew the it. concept of a bottle of wine, maybe, but yeah. you never actually had it. But, I, you know, and you've been in the Finger Lakes, you know, like it's been a couple of years here. 
Uh, and we drove over that hill that where you come down into Havensport and now okay, any of you have been to the Finger Lakes know it's just stunningly beautiful and these big long lake and this little picturesque village and then and, and the vineyards cascading down to the winery and then we went into this big bat room with tanks full of booze and pretty girls giving tours and there wasn't a cow in sight and I literally went yeah, I did. points. I could have been a wine maker. <laughs> and I didn't get the internship. What? You Wait, didn't. okay, so I, all right, so, so explain <laughs> a, this. A little known part of the story is two of us went over to interview for the work study program. And uh, and uh, they had to choose which one of us would get it. And the other guy was a year older. And so um, they, uh, and I now had dedicated my life to making wine. This was my way out. This was my job. I don't know what the either other guy was even doing there. Well, they gave him the job and I was so disappointed. And I did literally, I saw my life just going, oh my God, there was my one chance gone. And it was literally, I was getting ready to end the semester and head back to a uh, uh, climber to work at Welch's. When uh, I got noticed, I got a call from them and said, hey, the other guy has decided that he, he isn't going to want to do it. And we'd still love to have you. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it's one of those, uh, one my, of those, my, one my, of those forks in the road that just, well, well and I remember exactly. because uh, uh, the first person I told was uh, Bill Quain and uh, we were living at the fraternity and, uh, and uh, Paul Evans and they uh, went and got a bottle of, uh, uh, some kind of a, I think it was cold duck, and um, and we celebrated. Um, we get drinking cold duck out of coffee cups, which are the only glasses we could have. They're so. the best names for wines back then. Oh, you know, blue duck, nun, yeah. cold yeah. duck. Okay, yeah. it's great stuff. Yeah, that's very. So cool. anyway, so I'm now I'm back into the wine business and spent three every other semester while I was at Cornell working and uh, and they moved me around everything from the vineyards to grower relations to bottling to purchasing to uh, lab work to giving tours to it was really an amazing marriage i owe that family a great deal of course now it's not it's no longer the i remember family. going back there uh, one of the first times you ever brought connor and kelly and i back to the finger lakes uh we were driving past the taylor wine company and they were do you uh, mind if i pour you just one no, I, would be, I would be thrilled thank you and they were literally uh selling off the redwood lumber from the yeah. old redwood tanks yeah. and it was uh you were kind of looking at it like holy holy moly yeah you know that nowadays you can still find the taylor brand in your uh in your local corner store uh, it's usually down on the bottom shelf it's you know cream sherry or something like that uh, it's really just a brand at this point it's not made there anymore yeah, it's not that. made in the finger lakes or anything it's, no. I, I forget who owns it. some some corporation or owns it at this point yeah but back when you were there it was the family it was the real deal yeah and uh, but there was dissent in the family because uh, uh, the oldest son, a guy named uh, Walter Taylor, who was the heir apparent, said, I don't like wines made from these Lebrusca grapes. I think we can do better. And he was advocating making wines from uh, hybrids of the Nifra. And, uh, and this was a huge controversy. How could he be blasphemous? And he started his own winery. And if any of you know the colorful labels of Holy Hill, um, you know, that, that was a that was a crazy time. And, and, but there are also people there who were envisioning making wines from vinifera, particularly Riesling. And, uh, you know, Dr. Constantine Frank, who I spent more than one afternoon with, who was just absolutely a fundamental influencer in my life. Uh, Herman Beamer, who was the winemaker at Molly Hill, but uh, uh, came from a German winemaking. He was secretly making Riesling at his farm. Uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, few other people, including Peter Johnstone, the founder of Aaron Hill, who was just passionate about French wines and thought he could grow uh, vinifera in the Finger Lakes. And I fell into this group and and started tasting uh, better wines than Pink Catawba pretty quickly. But I think that's an important point, Dick, because I remember going to Dr. Frank, which Doc, Dr. Constantine Frank is still uh, still a producer over at Yeah. 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 Um, and you know, they're still family owned. Still yeah. family owned uh, by the Franks family. but. Uh, and Herman Beamer still around, made yes. by his, now his successor, yeah. Fred Merwarth. And, uh, and Oscar. Yeah. And Oscar, uh, still around, still making, Aaron Hill, Aaron Hill is still, uh, still around. But these were kind of the, the revolutionaries, really, in the Finger Lakes. Making, it, it, we're, doing we're, stuff almost underground at first and getting ridiculed for it. 
But then now, if you go to the Finger Lakes, what, what do you do? You go to drink Riesling. Well, and, and, and we'll skip a little bit. We're, we're going to have to come back to the Finger Lakes after we skip ahead a little bit. But yeah. uh, anyway, so I'm working all the time and, and doing what classes I can to uh, study winemaking and uh, ended up graduating in uh, 1975. I just, uh, had gotten every course that I could that related to winemaking and got a degree in cheese making. Yeah, yeah, because we had no degree. <laughs> it turns out that if, if you uh, the, the fermentation science uh, is like you open up a chemist a biochemistry textbook, fermentation's about a, a real thin slice of that. The, the science of all of this is not uh, it's not rocket science, and, and there and there's a lot of shared territory between f the fermentation of cheese and the fermentation of uh, alcoholic fermentation. Yeah, and a, and a lot of other fermented products as well, and I. And there was a genius professor there, Frank Kozakowski, who uh, I became his uh, assistant and uh, um, strongly influenced me as well. So Cornell was just a fundamental part of my life, no doubt about it. Very cool. But it was a spring break at uh, 1975 at uh, Cornell that I got my first trip to the Napa Valley. Speaking of revolutionaries of the time, so <laughs> you came out to Napa. Um, spring break, bus trip, and it says here, love at first sight. Well, I, and, and so, so, so you described going over the hill down into the Finger Lakes and going, okay, this is pretty sweet. But then you came down, the, how, how did you, did you actually come up through Napa and, and just saw the valley? <laughs> well, a buddy of mine, John Casper, joined me and we, uh, we, he thought he had a, he could borrow his dad's car and we were going to drive across country to the Napa Valley because we couldn't afford to fly. And uh, uh, about a week before, and we had this whole trip planned, and a week before, it said, that's, you're not taking my car to California. <laughs> and uh, so we, we thought we were busted. And, um, but the, then I found the, uh, this great deal for back then. You could get the $69 Ameripass on the Greyhound bus, and you could go anywhere in the country for $69. Don't ever do that, by the way. Uh, <laughs> not, <laughs> so we, not recommended. Huh? We, we, we got on the bus and hit to New York, and five days later, uh, we ended up in the, in the <laughs> Napa Valley. Like yeah. <laughs> and uh, so spring break was almost over by the time we got out there, so we had to extend it a little bit. But uh, uh, we, we uh, it got into Vallejo, where the bus stop was, which I thought was the Napa Valley. But uh, it, you know, the, you get to go a little bit north. We have to go a little bit north, like 20 miles north. And so we started out hitchhiking up to Napa. It was a Sunday afternoon. He had, a, um, uh, well, there was a young woman in our tasting group, Helen Turley, who thought her brother had just bought a place there. She didn't have a phone number for me. He was a doctor, but she had an address of this place he bought. And she says, I bet if you go up there, he'll, he'll put you up. And, uh, and so we were going to hitch up, hike up to this place, but it was hard to get a ride. And because it was a lot further than we thought and started raining and, but we finally got a ride. Were, in, were you going uphill? Uh, yeah, going places. uphill both ways. Um, but I remember just coming into the valley and seeing the Robert Mondavi winery and the old Engelhoff winery and Bill you and all these names that I, I knew of. Now, I have to tell you, 1975, you have no idea. It was, this place was really, really, Napa was so backward at that time. I mean, the first new winery we built after Prohibition was Mondavi in 66. And so this was early, 75, this was early in the, in the history of Napa wines, but there were a handful and, and more every day. And uh, it was just enchanting, one of those mist coming over the hills and you know how Napa could be so fundamentally beautiful. And you could just, I feel this is true of almost any wine region you go to. There's, there's a feeling that comes over you and uh, you know, it's, it's, you, you never feel the same as when you're in Burgundy or, or you know, when we were in the vineyards of Bordeaux last spring and, 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 and Barolo, you know, these. I was going to point out Barolo. I, that, been, that's the feeling I have looking over the hills of Alanga and Barolo and Barbaresco and just going. And, well, and I know some of you have experienced this because you, when you feel that when you come to Napa. And by the way, next Monday, we're going to start to open back up a little bit for yeah. visitors. So. Start planning your trip. We, we want to have you back. Well, we want to see you. But Napa was just magical from the minute mm -hmm. I got here. There was no one at the house when we got at Larry's place. And so we, now it was dark and uh, John and I decided Wait, to- Why didn't you just go up to Aberge de Soleil? <laughs> Free Aberge de Soleil. <laughs> Free Aberge de Soleil. Did they have, was there electricity in Napa at that time? Not at Larry's place. <laughs> <laughs> it, was still, it was still running up a water wheel. Yeah. 
but we, we eventually meet Larry and, and what a generous uh, and wonderful guy. Uh, he, he put us up, we, we cooked dinner, uh, he got, got back later and uh, he lent us the truck because I needed to go over and talk my way into UC Davis and we got to see the Napa Valley over the next few days and I was absolutely convinced just like I was when coming down that this was going to be be my life. I think we actually have a photo of, of John and Larry. Maybe it's a couple of years probably after they met, but uh, kind of a cool old photo. Yeah, yeah. Back yeah. in the day, back in, and uh, it, your hair had color in the back then. Yeah, I still have that six pack. It's just the <laughs> <one>. <laughs> it's just <laughs> <like Larry's new. laughs> <laughs> oh really? Okay. Yeah. Well, Larry just had a birthday too, so we were sitting. Was, a this was back when Larry was shorter than you too. Yeah, that's right. yeah, no, Larry's never been shorter. I mean, Larry's six six, <laughs> I think. Yeah. And uh, and but Larry was so generous, and uh, and uh, you know, um, and there's so many stories to tell about uh, Larry's place, which he had bought and we were fixing up. Discovered it had been a frog grazing farm a, a more than a century before he bought it. It was yeah. one of the oldest properties in left the Napa, part of the old bale mill up there, and just a magical, magical place. And so when I came back and spent the summer of 75 with Larry and, and he let us stay at his place, uh, it was just me at that point. Um, and then and, and Bill and Paul Evans joined me eventually. And it was just a, um, a summer of um, camping and rebuilding Larry's old place and working. And I got a job. And you got I a got job. My first job in the one. Okay, so, so we'll, we're going to pause there for just a second because that's this is kind of where things get, go off, the, you know, uh, go off the rails in a way <laughs> and really start moving fast. But we've got some other stuff folks are tasting. 07 Cab, it should be in a really nice spot mm. right now. Uh, Rachel Rossi, FB from 16. Oh, nice. lots of people are drinking rosé too, huh? Yeah, oh, lots of Grand Vie, Grand Vie, Can you pronounce it for us? Le Grand Vie Rougeante. Nice job, yeah. dude. Yeah. <laughs> For a lot of time in France. 18 and 19 <laughs> sub long. Very yeah. cool. And what is this? 2001? Oh, my Turley God. Zinfandel. Turley Zinfandel. <laughs> nice pull. I hope there's no open flames. <laughs> yeah. 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 Keep away from open flames. Yeah. Make sure you've got fire returning clothing on here. <laughs> oh, one. That's a, that's a, that's an early, that's uh, early Zinfandel. Yeah. And then we got a question here. Is John still making cheese? Uh, he's, he's definitely cutting cheese these days, but he's uh, I'm not still making cheese. Or going to again sometime? Maybe anyone else? In the well, we, we might we might get back to that story because I I, I did take a I think it was my midlife crisis in the uh, early part of the. You had a midlife cheese making crisis. Yeah, you know, yeah. Talk that. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, so we'll come back to that question in a, in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And so that uh, there's another question. You know, remember visiting the winery ten years ago and there was cheese aging in the room in the lower yeah, yeah. floor. So those are uh, those yeah. are part of our cheese making experiments, which. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll get to that when we. Uh, I don't think we have those. I don't think we had that picture of me holding up or having uh, Daniel Bruce uh, hold up one of the cheeses I was making. There was those, those were big cheeses. Yeah. So um, yeah. Very cool. um, so I, I know, so, how, to so still you know how to make cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so you got a job. I got a job. Larry had some friends who were about ready to bottle their first wine. They needed help, and uh, and he recommended me, and so I. Um, uh, hitchhiked down to, and and uh, got a job as the first employee of Stag's Leaf Wine Cellars. Warren and Barbara Winiarski hired me. They they were uh, bottling the uh, seventy three Cabernet Sauvignon, and uh, and of course any of you who know California wine history know that that is one of the most famous bottles of wine that have ever been made in in the Napa Valley. Uh, and uh, I take considerable credit because I am the person who dumped the glass bottles onto the bottling line to go and get filled with the 73 cab that won the Paris tasting. And if you had those models not been dumped, dumped correct, if you correctly. put them on upside down, the, the bottles never would have been filled. <laughs> the bottle, they, they wouldn't have been able to taste it. You know, so, so it really, it takes a village, folks, to make these wines. So. Well, uh, Stag's Leap was very small. It was, the, it was actually their second vintage, but their really first uh, vintage was 73. And now this is 75, so they were just, they were just bottling the 73. But I worked there, and so I I got to work extensively with the '74, and I made the '75 and the '76 uh, Stag Loop Cabernet. And I think we actually do we have that bottle. Well, we have a bottle. Here. It's yeah. a demo bottle. We're not going to drink this, but uh, okay, you know, where are you going? Oh, you're going to get the bottle. Yeah. So um, well, we're not, we're not going to drink it because it's real valuable. We bought it from this guy Rudy Cunierawan. Oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> we don't know. Uh, we're not sure what it's filled with, you know. But yeah. very cool old bottle. 
we, uh, 1976, Cabernet Sauvignon. Lot, lot two. So th this was real popular back in the day. Yeah, yeah. So you had a lot one and a lot two. You were coming up with all sorts of ways to not sell Cabernet. I was not part of that decision, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, we may have screwed up lot one. I can't remember. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, our second chance. I, I can't even tell you. Uh, and, and the job at, uh, at uh, uh, Stag's Leap was fundamental because Warren is, of course, when I, is one of the great winemakers in the world. Uh, but he had also engaged the talents of Andre Chelischeff, who was the consulting winemaker there at the time. And my job basically was to bring up samples for them to uh, taste and uh, talk about and so on. And I got to hang out with that. I also got to pick up the kids at school and work on the patio and uh, cut, uh, cut poison oak away from the winery. And it was whatever it took to, to work that summer. But, but you didn't stay in Napa. So, so you, you were at, you were at Stag's Leap for that. Um, that time but you were well i had talked my way into classes over at uc davis for right. a master's degree and so warren said well look we can work out your hours of, of of study because during the harvest i need you uh so you've got classes all day but the grapes don't come in until the afternoon so you just come back over and 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 uh work and then you can go back for class so this is what i was doing was taking classes during the day and working harvest and uh in the afternoon or the evening right in a motorcycle back in a forth. little 100 350 motorcycle back back and forth uh, to to get the job done so cool. kind of crazy times yeah wonderful. then you you graduated with a master's degree from uc davis the, pr the premier winemaking school in the, in the united states well you know that larry and i had started making wine and that's the really the story because you know i reminded remind you that we found out larry's place had been a frog raising farm and uh and and he wanted to make a little wine that summer and there were four chardonnay vines in the middle of the cast 23 vineyard it wasn't called that at that point at uh at stag's leap and and uh warren said you or uh, i think he said you could have those grapes and it was just enough to make one of those <laughs> you vines. think he said that yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 sure. I recall him saying that well it would have ruined the capital so it was right, good yeah. that they took them out and we took them back and made one of those, you know, the little glass jugs. We actually fermented in the creek, which was the only place that was cool enough. And uh, and we aged it. Uh, it was still fizzing a little bit. And we decided we better test it. We had run it out of a Fetzer Premium Red. Right. And I believe that a small group of us, including Mr. Curry and a few other people, um, uh, drank four of that five gallons. And, and somewhere during that night, in honor of uh, the frog farm where we made the wine, and Stag's Leap, where we'd stolen, where we'd gotten the grapes. Um, <laughs> Requisition. Uh, someone someone's, uh, it slurred it and said, this rocks leap pretty good, you know, and, and that stuck, the name stuck. So people ask me, how do we get the name Frog's Leap? I said, we've been drinking. That, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the long that's, story that's behind the, the name Frog's Leap. It, yeah. it, it, it took a little bit of uh, some, some purloined grapes and some, uh, some moonshining skill, some Georgia moonshining skill probably from, uh, from Larry and yeah. some. We, you know, uh, well, he was a doctor. Yeah, and doctors yeah. knew a lot about wine, that's for sure. Yeah. So it was a, a crazy, crazy, wonderful, formative um, summer that um, went on to inspire us to make a commercial winery a few years down the line. But we'll get there next. But when I graduated from Cornell, there were uh, from uh, Davis. from Davis in uh, 77, there were lots of assistant winemaker jobs available. And there was one winemaker job available where you could be the winemaker oh, yeah. and i said hell what's this, this assistant stuff i want to be the winemaker but the job was back in the finger lakes at a little winery that's the year 77 that new york state had decided to uh, pass this farm winery laws allowing it for the first time for small wineries to get started under new york state law and three of them started in 77 heron hill wagner and glenora wine cellars and the four gentlemen who started Glenora, uh, uh, wonderful, all of them. Uh, I, I think Gene is still the only one with us, uh, but um, uh, it just they invited me back to interview from this job. And they said, we want to start a winery. We don't exactly know what we're doing. We got some money. We got a space for the winery. We've already started to think about what the construction would be, but we need someone to drive the whole bus. And I said, well, hell, I worked at Stag's Leap for two summers. I have, a, I have a master's degree, yeah. <laughs> I, was so, I know everything, right? <laughs> I was so unprepared for this job if they had any idea. But, uh, <laughs> but it, it is actually the, the first instance in which we have photo evidence of you being a real wine. That's right. That's right. <laughs> there must be photos hidden somewhere. But uh, 
Yeah, so this is the aging cellar at uh, Glenora, and that must have been about the 78 or so. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, and we were making some of the first wines in this new generation of Finger Lakes wines. And uh, I feel very connected. We were talking about that uh, earlier. I feel very connected to this, what is now this really vibrant uh, uh, wine industry in New York State, making wines not from Concord and Catawba yep. or even hybrids, but from Vitus Nipra, Riesling, Chardonnays, Cabernet Francs. Uh, they're trying Pinot, Pinot Noirs. Pinot Noirs in a few uh, cases. Blau Francus, things like that. They got all sorts of crazy yeah, ideas. Amazing wines. If you don't know those wines, they're really worth tracking down. I recommend Herman Deemer. Uh, uh, uh wines are they ship all over the world and they're great or uh red tail ridge red tail ridge or, ravines uh, uh bloomer creek all sorts of great yeah great because we'll link out. into your history because you were there uh, at some point uh we'll, we, we we need to start threading we got to get the 1984 yeah we're not even back to california <laughs> at this point <laughs> um so you were at glenora but just for a couple of years three years uh 77 8 and 9 and that's where i met this uh, beautiful young lady and uh, she was from California, and uh, she says, uh, "Yeah, we're uh, you know." As I got more, as we got more interested in each other, she says, "You realize that if you and me were heading back to California, <laughs> she wasn't yeah. as in the uh, yeah. yeah, <laughs> all right." <laughs> oh, twist my arm right here, here we go. And that would be your mother. Yeah. And uh, we met in the Finger Lakes. Uh, she was a nursing student, and. Uh, uh in uh, new york city uh, but was up visiting her at that time fiance i don't know if you knew that and, uh, <laughs> I hear that and uh and uh and uh, so early scandals we, of early scandals of frog sleep and so when we got uh, married in 1980 uh it was my chance to come back to the napa valley i had really set lenora up for successor i think and 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 i think i know now because they are still one of the oldest and most successful wineries in, in the Finger Lakes. So I feel very good about that. But it was also a, an important time because no one knew what these small wineries were going to do. And uh, they had a statewide competition uh, that year. And uh, we entered 13 wines in, uh, in uh, 1978 or 9, I don't know. So it was 79. 79. And we had a, a, a 11 of our 13 wines got metal, including nine gold medals. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Back then, a pretty big deal. So. Well, <laughs> except yeah, I can't take a lot of credit because it was like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, there was, <laughs> was, they were doing oh, nice, real nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't a genius to make it. There wasn't much competition. And, uh, but it got written up in the New York Times by a guy named Frank Ryle and really was the first exposure of me nationally as being a winemaker i was called the upstate upstart and um, it was uh, it was how uh, mike robbins of spring mountain read of me and called me and said i need a winemaker back in california if you're ever thinking about coming back here and, and you and you had entered because you had entered the the riesling your i think your 78 or 79 riesling into this competition you told me that you still consider that one of the best wines you've ever made but it, it didn't come in first place at the at you you came in second place and well, you lost that's, to. Uh, it's a big part of why I moved back to Napa Valley is that they had a um, uh, they had a uh, the best of show in this was a uh, so these were wines you didn't have to be grape wines and so even though our Riesling got a gold medal it did not get best of show because that went to a blueberry champagne and I said I'm out of here. <laughs> 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 you can't. You couldn't compete with a blueberry champagne. Can't, you know, if they're going to give the best of show to a blueberry champagne, I hold this beer. <laughs> yeah. And you moved back to meet and uh, work for a guy, Mike Robbins, who had a little project going in Napa. I think that's one that's going to be our next one. It is, yes. And and, uh, and so this, uh, I actually got back there in order to work uh, in time to work on the seventy nine and maybe eighty through eighty. So this is a historic bottle last one i have left maybe i can find some more somewhere but this is the 82 spring mountain vineyard so this would have been completely uh, a wine that i uh picked uh they made every decision i made every decision on. i've never had this wine so this would be kind of interesting yeah so uh there we go and um uh, and uh you know the, the color isn't great but the aromas are uh, the aromas are still there this yeah. one when we're you know we we're gonna Tasting this 82, when you taste wine like this, that's uh, approximately 800 years old, um, 
Yeah, you're really so, you're really more focused yeah. on whether is this wine alive or not. This wine's alive. This one's it's, yeah, it's got yeah. it's got a it's got some character to it. Wow. Yeah. Well, uh, and and we know these wines age for a, a long, long time. We we actually took the whole winery up for a tour of Spring Mountain um, uh, you know, one day uh, a couple years ago, and they were so proud to bring out Golden Wine, and they brought out the '79, which was the wine that I. Uh, inherited and, and brought to, I may have no idea that I was involved in it. And it was kind of fun to uh, I'd see these older vintages lasting cool. so long. Yeah. That's very cool. So you got back to Napa Valley and you were working for Spring Mountain and you reconnected with Larry somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your mom and I got married at the frog farm, one thing. And so uh, Larry continued to be so, so generous and uh, was now, as he was an emergency room physician, was very interested in getting into the wine business, always had this passion deeply held in him. And he says, let's, let's, John, let's start a wine, start a wine and let's start a winery. And I thought, well, he's a doctor. He's got all the money we need. And, uh, you know, I, I can figure out how to do this. I already started one winery. And so I asked Mike Robbins at Spring Mountain if it would be, I think I did. Uh, if it'd be okay. <laughs> Again, and, uh, yeah. Some well, faulty and, memory. And, and Larry, Larry was helpful in that. And uh, so, yeah. So in uh, 1981, I, uh, I said, well, Larry, you know, we're going to need some money for this. He thought, oh, shit, I don't have any money. Um, so we, uh, we, we raised $5,000 a piece and lost frog sleep in 1981. And so this is, yeah, so I'm now still the full-time winemaker at Spring Mountain. Larry's still a full-time doctor. Your mom's a full-time healthcare nurse. Yep. And, uh, but we, we decided to do this all together. And, um, you know, we, we just, it was not supposed to be serious. We were making illegal amounts of wine, homemade wine uh, before that. In fact, I think I have a picture. Isn't there a picture of me uh, getting barrels for our... Uh, yeah, our that's the next, the next photo yeah. we have here. When, when, you're, uh, when, when you pour all your money, all your entire life savings into it, uh, into your winery, you got to find barrels uh, one way or another. So well, tell me to, to give the story behind this. But right? <laughs> You got to find bargains. There's, there's, there's the six pack, by the way, in yeah. case anybody was missing. So this is the, these are the barrels that made the, uh, we're going to taste the wine that were aged in these barrels. Um, but uh, there was a, a winery called Carmenier and they had too many French oak barrels that had been used. They were in a cave. They didn't look good. And I went over and I drove over there in, in our pickup truck, which you see here. And uh, I said, well, how much are the barrels? And they said, uh, well, uh, they're, tw they're, uh, I think twenty dollars a piece, uh, or we'll give for two hundred dollars. You can uh, as as many as you get on their truck because they didn't think that I could get ten barrels in the truck, and we got twenty eight <laughs> barrels on the truck. <laughs> and so I got. And you're ter terrified people up and down yeah, twenty nine, so or you would have if anybody had been actually driving. No, we had to we had to drive them over the <laughs> oh, mountain. <no. laughs> Very uh, safe. Very I think safe. we started out with 29, but uh, <laughs> we ended up with 28. <laughs> up there on the mountain still. So those barrels only cost about five bucks a piece. I'm pretty proud, <laughs> yeah. pretty proud of it. Yeah. And it went into our next one. So we're going to have a little bit of a, a, a taste off. Here. Our, yeah. Yeah. Throw down. Yeah. Get, get clean glass. Oh, yes, yeah, sir. Okay, you're, paying, you're paying attention. Yeah, well, you're paying not paying so much attention service here. you love this wine. We're going to taste a wine that I have only had once in my life. And you only had uh I'm not last, had time, last time we had this was about 12 years ago i have not had but we don't have many bottles of this left but this is the first cabernet sauvignon uh that we made at uh, frog sleep so the 1982 so this is the 82 spring mountain i made this and this is the 82 frog sleep i made this and uh and if you ever if you ever get your hands on a label of this you'll notice all the digits for the vintage are actually not in alignment it's because it was a uh, Set with a Gutenberg press, oh, I think back on still it's still ox driven <laughs> and the whole the whole, the whole shebang. Oh so. my god! Yeah, but very cool. Save this for my birthday party in a couple of weeks. By the way, I've got more bottles of this. Nobody bought hey, it. Hey, you guys, then, so. so we're gonna have a um, uh, you know my birthday's coming up in a couple of weeks, and we're gonna have a virtual uh, birthday party. I don't know what this is gonna look like yet, but I'm hopefully gonna call in a few uh, friends to come in and and uh, and tell me how amazing I am. And uh, and uh, we're gonna uh, you know drink some. Uh, some we're still looking for those friends. To yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's why we needed two weeks. <laughs> that's why we're being a little vague. On it right now. <laughs> we keep calling around and nobody nobody will pick up the phone. For maybe maybe Bill Flame will call. Yeah, maybe we'll get we'll get one guy. We got some we got some uh, some reliables in here. Yeah, this wine is uh, fruity. This wine has fruit in it. 
after nearly 40 years. Well, crazy. who would drink this spring mountain when they could have frogs? Leap? That's what I'm talking about. Frogs Leap wins the competition on this. Jesus, this is. This, this is pretty is, good. This is solid. Did, did you replace this with some old burgundy or something like that? Some old, Do you think it smells like feet? burgundy? Um, it's it's bright. It's fresh. It's got a tremendous amount of fruit. The barrel work on this was amazing. Oh, uh, amazing <laughs> stuff! You know, it's a real French oak influence on this. You know, speaking of stuff that other, some other folks are having, the 14 Chardonnay, that's awesome. Uh, that, hopefully that's singing right now. 12 Zinfandel. We tried that 14 Chardonnay. Yeah, we did. Just a few days. Yeah, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful they have it uh, it, it's showing well for everybody. Uh, the 12 Zinfandel should be uh, killing it right now. 06 yeah. Cab, definitely uh, fully open and really getting into its middle middle age. And then 19, somebody somehow found a bottle of 1987 Spring Mountain Cabernet. What? Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. Well, Greg Vita made that one. So yeah, this is yeah. the post, uh, the post uh, yeah. John Williams era. But, well, uh, and, and it, it, but it tells the story is that uh, I had I had gotten this uh, cellar at Spring Mountain straightened around, but things were happening. That's the time that they started falling crest up there. It was a a wild and crazy time. So, <laughs> you got to tell the story about. Uh, not being a, not qualifying as a winemaker for Falcon, Falcon Crest. <laughs> well, you know, you, when you're a, a winemaker and, and uh, you're you're bottling, it's you're about the worst mood you can be because nothing, can, lots of things can go wrong when you're bottling a wine. Almost nothing can be good about bottling wine. It's it's really a traumatic experience. And we were bottling, um, gosh, I don't know what vintage it must have been at the time. They were shooting the pilot for Falcon Crest. And uh, they had all the trailers out there. Um, they weren't actually filming, but we were bottling. But all the uh, uh, actors were in place. And we started up the bottling line, is, and, and we were running. And in comes this guy and says, uh, I'm sorry, you need to shut down this machine because it's disturbing, uh, it's disturbing Jane Wine in the star of our uh, Pocket Crest show, and she doesn't need that noise right now. I says, well, you can go tell Miss Jane Wyman that she can go uh, have some fun with herself because you know that we're bottling we can't you know we're not going to shut down the bottling line and uh the guy strode off he went upstairs and about 10 minutes later mike robbins comes down and says john we need to we need to shut down the bottling line for a little while it's bothering Jane Lyman. and i said that's when i started plotting my, plotting your exit my yeah. exit from spring mountain here and, and literally blueberry champagne falcon crest this, this is the perfect date for you then you know oh my God. anybody wants to design a perfect birthday for john williams it's blueberry champagne and uh, reruns, and reruns of Falcon Crest. Falcon Crest. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are my age and don't know what Falcon Crest is, uh, old soap opera, uh, just Shut totally up. ridiculous. We've got a bottle of, of, we've actually had a bottle, Alexia brought a bottle one year of we had branded some, Falcon Crest uh, Chardonnay or something like that. Well, we, had a, we had a Gamay, we had a, all kinds of wines. So it was actually left over Pinot Noir. We, we, is this where you learn no gimmick too cheap for us? <laughs> <laughs> they were crazy times to say the least. And but meanwhile, here Frog's Leap was just released now its first wine. Remember in 81, Larry came and said, look, let's make some commercial wines. And so 81 was our first vintage. And many of you who have been with us for a few weeks know that we tried the 81 Sauvignon Block and amazed ourselves. Here's the 82 Cabernet. Well, we uh, amazed. Well, I amazed myself. We constantly amaze ourselves. Oh, we're, we're genius. Oh, we're it's genius. really it's this come, every, with every tasting, every week that goes by, we just becomes apparent how bit more of a genius uh, you yeah. are than we, than we thought. And by the way, how much time do we have? Left? Holy crap! We've not even we got to hurry. Okay, okay. okay. So okay. we've just gotten to the formation of Frog Sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so let's run through this, Roy. Right? So we started through. It takes off. The the, the head wine writer of the New York Times. Uh, at the time, writes uh, gets a hold of a bottle of the 81 Sauvignon Blanc and writes it up in the New York Times. Frog Sleep, a prince of the wine. We have every distributor in the country calling us. We're getting uh, reviews for our Cabernet Sauvignon, starting with the 84, the 86, the 87. We're all on the front page of the wine spec. We were the cult winery of that period in time, uh, along with a, a few of my friends like uh, Doc Horn and Schaefer, and John Schaefer, and so on. And Dan Duckhorn and, and we were rocking it and we were rolling, we were going and and we had no money. And and meanwhile, Larry is saying, I want to get involved in the wine. I want to be the winemaker. And we had to have a come to Jesus. And and we had that about 1994 uh, was the year we decided to start a second winery called Turley. 
And then we made the value of those two wineries the same and we split it too. So Larry could have 30. So he started a new winery at the Frog Farm, the old place for Frog's Leap. And we started, a, we kept Frog's Leap, the old name, but moved to where we are now, the Red Barn. We found this beautiful Red Barn. Do we have a picture of the winery? We did. It's yeah. photo number seven. Natalie, we're going to skip skip one or two here. But uh, there is a photo. Oh, of we can't skip. We got to go back to that one photo showing uh, my first seller helpers at, the, at Frog's Leap. Uh, or no, this is yeah, the Frog's Leap. We uh, uh, we didn't have a lot of money for uh, people to uh, work on staff, and so these were my uh, uh, assistant winemakers, uh, uh, Tyler and Rory. Rory's doing the stirring, and, and, Ky and Kyler's doing the directing. And yeah, and Kyler, and Kyler was right. <laughs> so yeah, in the, like, the, <laughs> the Hammond for the camera. So. Yeah, Hammond for the camera. What yeah. else do we have? This now? is actually how you kept us uh, kept us busy. Well, back we did. There. We couldn't afford a babysitter. <laughs> so you can come out and stir the no, no babysitter like a like a like a bucket, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Kelly was sweeping behind the tanks in her in her playpen, I think, at that at that point. Uh, so this was this really incredible time. Uh, but then we had a chance to move to the Red Barn, and we found this beautiful old Red Barn that needed a little bit of repair. Do we have, yeah. How many photos of this do we have? But I think uh, you can see it needed a. I, it needed I just a chose this one photo of it just to show everybody. You know, this really was a vineyard equipment shed that was falling over, and this is kind of after your mid process of taking all the old wood off, putting new wood in, putting all the steel beams in, and and. Uh, well, I remember as a little kid having all the wood off of there and in piles and we would go, Connor and Hill and I would go out there and it was like yeah. this jungle of wood to build forts out of and stuff like that. Yeah. It drove the construction guys crazy. Yeah, because you were 10 at that point. Yep. And, uh, and, uh, and there are pesticide containers and shit out there. We had to remove all this ground, but any of you who have been at the winery and know the Red Barn, well, at that's one point, that's what it looked like. It was... Uh, we had a lot of work to do. And of course the barrel shade wasn't here. The vineyard house wasn't here. There were no trees. It was, it was yeah. pretty, uh, pretty crazy time, but it turns out it had been a built as a winery, uh, 99 years before, no, uh, more than a hundred years before that. So this is 110 old, years before. An old ghost winery of Napa Valley, but, uh, you know, we got a chance to, to rebuild it. So I think there's a photo of, of my dad and Kelly. Yeah, uh, that's the dedication. This is the groundbreaking ceremonies to restore the old Adamson winery as Frog's Leap. And we made, uh, we, we, we actually made wine there in uh, 1994 by Hook and Crook. And uh, I is mean, that, is that a Canadian tuxedo that you're that you're rocking there, Dan? I'm looking oh, pretty good. Some huh? jean on jean. Yeah, look, I got cut my hair at least. Look, <laughs> you see who's in the background there is Frank, there right? You go. And, uh, but you know, we, there's so many, we're gonna to have to do a whole nother version of this because we're leaving so many important people out of this, including Frank Leeds, who had now uh, was tasked with risk. Cause this, this old barn came with 40 acres of dead vineyard. And I had to go to Frank and say, Look, Frank, I can't replace these vineyards. Now you gotta, you gotta raise these vineyards and bring them back to life. And he did. And, and literally we would not have survived financially if he had he not. Now Pablo had come over as cellar master. Paul had joined us in 94, it was really, this whole rebuilding of what it meant to to be uh, to be frog sleep and, and there's the team in 1994 harvest 1994 with yeah. the with the walls still uh, still in progress and a generator in the tanks arrived the day before the grapes uh, or the same day I can't remember it was uh, it was nip and tuck and I did not have a plan B <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool yeah. Yeah. You know, it's uh, we may have, let's pause it there and answer some questions. Sure. Uh, people have some questions, and I think it's uh, it's pretty cool to just you know that that's really where it kicks into hyperdrive, really in terms of it really does where the wines happen. go and yeah. everything. Yeah. Um, you know, whatever happened to late leap? You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you <laughs> so never... late leap, the first time you made it was eighty four, eighty six, something like that. Well, we 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 inherited all this old riesling, and so we were trying to find any way we could to uh, to uh, uh, sell riesling and. Uh, one idea was to make a late harvest like a trunken Marinaus Lisa. If you know your German wines, you know that uh, trunken means dried, rotted old berries and uh, and uh, essentially raisin. They make wine out of these raisins. And so we tried to do that. We called it Frogen Marinaus Lisa. We made the Leap Frog Mills. So um, I don't know if we think we'll ever make a late leap again. That was actually a Sauvignon Blanc, I think. I, uh, it's not every, it's not have, You know, we have a barrel of Shannon Blanc. <laughs> we do. And Tori told me I got to get that out. Of the yeah, board. exactly. <laughs> Much to Pablo's chagrin, we've got a bottle of uh, of unstable sweet wine in the in the uh, in the cold box. Right? We bottled it once. We did that. <laughs> we the problem is with Pablo the corks out, so now we got to bottle it again. Yeah. 
Maybe we need to be a spark. I, I, we, we like, we love making sweet wine at Frog's Leap. Uh, every 10 years or so, we actually get it right and, and produce something that can be bottled. Um, yeah. and mo most we kind of just do it to have something fun. God damn, this 82 cab is just vibrant. And I, you know, I, I think I did a better job on the. Did, which, they, did they teach you that language in Climber? Of what did I say? <laughs> Um, did you get to home? Did you get to take home any bottles of the '73? Oh yes. Oh yeah, yeah. And I uh, actually, Warren has given me a few bottles, and we uh, <laughs> and we I drink them as soon as he gives them to me uh, because I, <laughs> you know, but because uh, you have no concept of long term. You, you can, I, he sold those wines and finance that. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, we have loose seller control, as that we've said uh, many we, times. We, but I've had the '73 so many times. I actually prefer the '74. <laughs> And we're, we'll open that 76 uh, Snag Leap at, at some point with you all because it, it is an amazing wine. We, we, uh, and um, you know, those are certainly great. I think that's, it, you know, it's kind of funny that somebody had a question about, uh, you know, is it fun opening up all these bottles with you on camera? And it is kind of fun to, to have a reason to open these bottles up and share them. And, you know, we've been staring at the 82 cab forever, but it, it's been a very long time since we've had this wine. This wine is it's, it's rocking. It's really good. Well, look at his pedigree. This is Wildwood, Spotswood, and Fay. Yeah. Okay. So three, three of the greatest vineyards in Napa County back then. Uh, yeah. Were, you were able to, uh, by hook or by crook, get some grapes from. Yeah. 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 Actually, we, we bought the Fay. We uh, we made the Wildwood. Uh, you bought you bought one of one of the three. So uh, lots eight, of eight, grapes. eighty-two uh, Spotswood was selling Cabernet, and we bought some. And um, Wildwood was the vineyard Spring Mountain owned, and I bought some from Mike to make this wine. But at the last minute, Larry said he wanted more, and I knew uh, that there was some Fay Vineyard Cabernet that was available over at Soya Coyer Grove, and that's in this wine. So this is really, this has got pedigree, let's just put it that way. This is the year Spots, Spotswood started as well, see? 1982. Yeah. So kind of a crazy time. It, it, it's funny for me that hearing, you know, you tell stories about, you know, these really revolutionary times in Napa, driving into Napa when it was really still the sticks. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. and I made the joke about you, there being no even, You can't even imagine how it's been, how backward it was. But it's, so. it's funny because you, you've been then in, in a couple of places uh, in your career already with the Finger Lakes kind of before, you know, many years actually before it really hit it big. And now that area is just singing and the wines yeah, all over the world, right. world, world class, so, world class yeah. reasoning. I feel very connected to that. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. Um, and I remember going to Dr. Frank's uh, winery many years ago and going into this back room and there was a photo of Dr. Frank and Andre Chelyshev yeah. sitting, sitting, ne sitting next to each other drinking wine. Yeah. And it was sort of like there's, huh. you know, there's a, there, there's two revolutionaries really yeah. uh, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in the same spot. And you know, there, there's been a question up here for a while. Have we changed our business because of COVID in any way that you plan to continue long term, such as virtual tastings? And you know, <laughs> pertinent to the uh, to opening up old bottles and being able to share them and share the stories, I think that's one of been the one of the coolest things about uh, one of the, the big silver linings to all this, I should say. Hey, um, hey it's, it's kind of up to you guys because you know. Uh, uh so many of you are signing on to these every week and we're having fun doing it so as long as as long as we can make this work we might not do them as frequently as we've been doing them but this has been a blast for us but uh look we're not going to assure about this uh, uh covid 19 has not been good for frog sleep wine or anyone in the wild or anyone in our country and so um we're 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 struggling we're going to open back up for uh, visitors uh coming monday we'll see but we're with limited number of people but the, we've 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 got our we've had our hands full with all this. Not there's no pity party necessary here. It's just that we're all um, trying to figure this out. And these virtual tastings have been huge for us. I can't even tell you how fun it is that it, not only to connect with you guys and have you supporting us, but um, also the amount of wine you've been buying. You guys must drink a shitload of wine. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. actually made some money on these. Yeah. <laughs> it's been super fun to be able to taste these wines and, and tell stories. And shoot, we're gonna have, a, have to have a part two. I think uh, we have a part, part two. Part two, the actual story of frogs. You have to past all the other stuff. Well, that's true, <laughs> isn't it? Almost because or should we go do another ten minutes on the dairy farm? No, no <laughs> I, we got a little carried away in the dairy farm, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's important to know that, that we come from humble beginnings, and I think we carry that the spirit and i think even your brother and sister and you carry that spirit into um that's uh 
you know, there's been, uh, it's not been easy. And we, we, the parts that we're leaving out of here are the stresses that came into our family, the, the breakup with Durley, the breakup with your mom, the, the near bankruptcy at one point, uh, the, the struggle that went into making some of these wines. It's, uh, but then having you join and, and your brother and sister uh, uh, being part of this. And, and so it's been an amazing story. So yes, we can do a part two because we're now just really starting the modern history of, of Frog Sleeve. I don't know what pictures we have. Do we have any more pictures? We can flip through a few of them, but it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it is pretty incredible to still be really telling that story. And I think, um, I know those of you on Instagram are gonna have to restart here in just a second because we're up against an hour. Um, so please, uh, bear with us when we're reconnecting, but you know, it's uh, dad, you met Tori and, and yeah. man, little Owen, who's now uh, starting his sophomore year in college, yep. uh, which is yep. pretty, uh, just totally crazy. Yeah. Uh, I remember meeting yeah. Owen when he was about that young. And so it was yeah. very, very cool. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's kind of funny Deb, because we talk about all this ancient history and, and or what feels like ancient history in one respect. Ancient is uh, kind of a hard word, right? Coming up against her <laughs> birthday here. You know, maybe but, yeah. but, it, but, but it's funny, is it, I, it's a lot yeah. of those photos, you know, the photos of Kyder and I, and, you know, it doesn't feel like it was even that long ago. And, yeah. and it's kind of fun because we're still writing that history, uh, still going forward on it. You, yeah. you, you know, no, it says cool. there, damn pollen yeah, from those pollen trees. Flowers, and like system flowers. Flower. Crazy. Yeah. These yeah. have a really lovely uh, sage aroma to them, by the way. <laughs> it is fairly aromatic there. But look at that line up there, you guys. Frog sleeve, stag sleeve, and spring men. That's not a I wish I had a bottle of good art here. It's uh, uh it's kind of, it's kind of cool. Yeah. But um But we, I think we'll have to do a part two, Dad, and I, I, I think uh and we gotta keep keep working on this bottle of frog sleeve. Uh, but we may not have anyone still listening. We have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's uh you know, I, I think Next, uh, we're going to take next week off, but uh, the week following that, maybe we'll, we'll touch on a little bit of the modern history because we're going to we have a little bit of birthday party for you. Well, we, and, and I think that's, maybe that's appropriate because some of the people I would, I hope we can connect with Amigo Bob. I hope we can get Frank online and maybe we can even reach out to Larry and see if he'd call in for a second, but we got to get uh, uh, some of the uh, people who've been with us on this uh, ride and get your... Uh, uh, brother and sister, I mean, we're, we're going to see what we can do to get a few people to come in and chime in on the history of Frog Sleep, really uh, from the Red Barn on, because uh, that's an amazing story in and of itself. Uh, and, and Well, it's, it's and, interesting because you know, to that end, you know, this is, you know, once the Red Barn goes up, we showed the photo of the team in 94. You know, this is no longer John alone in the cellar at Glenora no. doing it all himself. And, yeah. And, on his yeah. own soul, soul journey, this is now a family, multiple families. This is where the, the real multi-generational part of the story of Frog right. begins. And it's it's where your involvement begins. Yeah. And uh, so I, let's, let's, let's uh, part two. Here's to part two. Here's to coming up with shit on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we love you guys. Uh, uh, we, you, we appreciate your continuing to support us. Please go out and scold uh, accounts that don't have frog sleep uh, for us on our behalf. And uh, I think we'll have a couple. Of, we'll have a couple of cool wines available for uh, for sale for the next. Oh, session. and maybe including one of the rarest wines. One there. of the rarest wines. I think that uh, there there may be. Jessica, am I right? We're going to have a bottle of. We're going to have ninety seven leapfrog milch available.